this is why this uh, I mean this generated my interest very well. So basically, I was in a talk. I remember I was in a talk uh, for I mean this guy. I mean this this person was this, was talking about advertisements in early post-war Singapore. And then of course, naturally, if you I mean if you have seen this magazine, you would not be surprised by the nature of uh, the advertisement. So there was an advertisement where a picture suddenly in one slide a picture of a beer ad in JavaScript. And of course the community was like, oh, wow. And all the, I mean, non malay community, they were surprised. And I guess if you do not, I mean, if, if you, I mean, if you are not familiar with the magazine, you'll be surprised by the nature of the magazine. I mean, a beer ad using JavaScript. But then again, if, uh, I mean, of course, this can be further, this should have been further de deliberated. But of course, in terms of historical knowledge, if I was sharing on historical knowledge, this was an eye opener for I mean, I guess for the Singapore community. Right, so why magazines? Uh, basically, uh, we can point um, Prof. Hamidi Amnan from uh, UM actually did a very good study on magazines and it was one of the first few. I mean, of course, not first few. I mean, William Prof. has done it in a smaller scale and then Prof. Uh, Dato Puke Kim also has done it in, in a way. And then there has been, there was a gap. Of course, Prof. Ahmad Adam did an exposure of Indonesian magazines, Indonesian publications, and now Amelia uh, in 2013, which I thought was a very good work. Because he pointed to the myriad features of a, the unique features of a magazine. Right, because as compared to newspapers, uh, I mean, magazines as compared to newspapers. But what's more critical is that voices that have claimed to represent Malay history uh, have, I mean, it's always been top down. So, in terms of uh, primary sources, I guess, there has been a great usage of um, newspapers, Malay newspapers, so some like you maybe perhaps has been a great uh, help in Malay history, but in terms of magazines, not really, right, because maybe magazines has been, I mean they have been seen as an informal source in a way, I mean they have like, so, I mean they have like centrality in uh, research on Malay social history, and of course there is a clear lacuna, I mean I've already said the lacuna, Right, so JavaScript magazines have like centrality in research. Previous works, um, like I said, in order to map out more important themes, have used uh, more official sources, like for example, uh, some like <coughs> so. Hamidi Amna in current academic literature has bothered to give us prominence to the uh, JavaScript magazine as a window to history, and of course, I mean, like I said, there has been previous biographical accounts like Ali Mam, but again, magazines have been like me. Right, so actually within the 1950s publication landscape in Singapore, JavaScript publication landscape in Singapore, you have Arab back, com Arab back companies, you have Singaporean Malay back companies, and then like a summary. So all of these companies were central in articulating issues about decolonization, independence, societal awakening, even uh, global news with regards to newly independent states like Indonesia back then, and of course uh, even uh, talking about intellectual Islamic discourse from Egypt and Turkey. So, of course, um, right now, I mean, we don't have, I mean, a lot of uh, Singaporeans don't have access, I mean, or rather don't have the capability to read Jawi in depth in, in such a manner. So there is a gap into understanding how magazines have used the content to understand, to re-understand and to conceptualize and articulate certain issues. Right, of course, um, in magazines, there's a, um, there's a slight informality to their approach, right? So. You have uh, various columns, you have uh, import, you have, <coughs> oral, you have letters from readers and different columns to, to showcase the freedom of thought, the degree of thought from various members of the public, that uh, class or your position in society. And magazines as well mentioned, it's a wealth of magazines and I think, I mean in terms, I mean it's not just limited to color or but I mean, there is an avenue for Singapore, uh, for Singaporeans to do this. Okay, so, um, so Timothy Barnett and Jan Benaput, they, they have written briefly that post-World War II writings in Singapore could be considered a cosmopolitan journalistic activism. Uh, journalists and writers were espousing a potent, uh, West went strongly for nationalism and independence and were increasingly becoming a potent force against, uh, against colonialism. Of course, it is indeed evident that uh, most publications emerged out of a need to represent and in the wider sense of the term, because it's vague. And most uh, publication presses, including my own case study, Kalam, uh, started out to be a voice that the community needs, or they claim that the community needs. Right? And then, although the, but of course, 
the notion of voice is vague at this point, and it can be observed that most of the publications intended to be alternative narratives to contemporary status quo. And one may ask who were their opponents, considering that these publications wanted to speak out. And while the narration and then the manifestation of ideas within publications can be interpreted in a variety of ways, um, the trajectory of editorials, their strategies, correspondence letters from readers, and subscription rates offers us into a peek into the publications and their reception. Okay. Um, of course, uh, I did a table of the various magazine publications in Singapore. And this is not new because Prof Ku Kim has done it, but he has done uh, in terms of Singapore and Malaysia. Prof Ahmad Adam has also done in terms of the Indonesian timeline. But I did a table and I can, I can, safely, I can safely argue that Singapore was right with one, different types of magazines. Right, two, different motivations for publishing. And three, of course there is a demand. Some magazines lasted for a decade, some lasted for just a few years. But clearly there's a demand, despite the argument, despite the argument that there is a lack of literacy in the Malay community. Right? So what, what I'm basically saying that there is a potential on re-exploring magazines as a tool for historical research. There's a common, uh, meaning the commonly white belief that Malays have low literacy back then can be easily disputed in a sense. Right? Um, so for my thesis, my research questions um, are currently, and they are, how would, I mean, what were the motivations behind the establishment of Kalam? How were these motivations translated into content for Kalam? And how did the post-World War II community, uh, Malay community, receive Kalam? Right? The concepts which I try to uh, try to try to find out, or rather, the concepts which I, I mean, the central concept. <coughs> this is Bangsa, print capitalism, and politics of landscape. Right? So basically, for Kalam, I mean, just a brief. Um, detail of my case study. So what is Kalam meaning? In Arabic, Kalam means pen or pencil. I guess it depends on what Q. Huh? Oh. Uh, Q, yeah, Q, yes. Uh, yeah, basically that, I mean, uh, my, thesis, my, my title for my thesis is The Quill of Kalam. So basically, yeah. <laughs> the, the pen of the pen, I don't know, I guess. So the first issue of Kalam magazine um, came out in July 1950. It was published by a man named uh, Said Abdullah bin Amin Al Idrus, more commonly known as Idrus. And his pen name Ahmad Lutfi. And in 1951, Kalam Press was formally established. Um, I mean, of course, they have been published since 1950, but they were using other presses. Right? Um, at their peak, they were hitting numbers of up to 30,000 copies per month. Per month, 30,000 copies. And um, this monthly periodical reached to places as far as Patani. And even Penang. And Penang could have I mean, was far. <laughs> Singapore back then. In Singapore, Kalam was distributed by bicycles. Uh, that's what they say. One of, the, one of the few things was bicycles. This last issue, I mean, of course, it ended abruptly, in my, in my opinion. It ended in October 1969. And throughout the existence of Kalam, um, Kalam published other short novels and newspapers. And it was clear that through research, Kalam magazine, I mean, its namesake, I mean, Kalam magazine was the flagship publication of Kalam Press. Um, and Professors Hirohiki Yamamoto and Sobo Yuji have mentioned that Kalam may have been the key publication in talking about Islam, the Islamic community in Singapore and Malaya, and whatever it was, Kalam was seen as a prime actor within the Malay language publication landscape. So knowing these facts and figures, studying Kalam will provide a window to understanding the reception towards Malay magazines in a way. I mean, Kalam is just one. There, have been, there are many, many, there were many magazines in uh, in Singapore alone, right? So, um, of course, there, are, there were various strategies like that, that Kalam uh, that Kalam employed. One, uh, they have they utilize. I mean, Kalam utilized various aliases to assert its diversity of writers. Second, uh, it tried to engage other writers and show to show, and showcasing to showcase global news and ideas. To, ex, uh, to assert expertise and authority. Um, and although I can't complete uh, everything in terms of strategies, but I, I, I need to mention one or two because I, I think uh, Kalam, I mean, this, this is one strategy that other members may have employed. For example, Kalam had, because I was really, because the first time I went to Kalam, I was amazed by his diversity of writers. And then one day with this same awe, I, I mean, I, I encountered a Column which, uh, column which eventually became a, a, a mainstay column called Halaman Kaum Ibu. 
It terus wrote as umum uh, umum um, umi musi. Depends on your transliteration. Initially, I was I didn't know who was umi musi. Initially, I didn't know. I, I thought it was a uh, uh, it was a female writer, but it turned but it turned out to be. I mean, various sources have asserted that okay, umi musi was Idris himself. And like this, uh, I was shocked because Idris wrote as a woman, giving advice to women, giving um, <laughs> writing as. Uh, I mean, writing about whether how single or married women should behave in a society or in a marriage. And this was just one of the many strategies that Kalam employed. Um, and imagine, like I said, his reception was reaching 30, I mean, 30,000 copies a month at its peak. So obviously through Kalam, we can see that uh, there is some sort of uh, an imagination of a community that Kalam employed. And he tried to envisage his environment. And of course, we can refer to various works from Anderson's Imagine community to see how magazines uh, imagine their own communities, imagine how I mean how their bunker could be and how I mean of course through <coughs> Idris is just one of the many ways. And of course uh, like I said, Prof Ahmad Adam's work, Prof Cook Kim's work, through this we can see how publications assert their own cipta, pencita and their own kebudayaan in terms of creating uh, knowledge for the community. So with that I, I end this I think it's time. Oh, yeah. oh. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if uh, Asma begins with um, the historical unit of a nation state, that we need to expand. Uh, at one time, I grew up uh, learning Singapore history, and Singapore history is part of Malayan history. Uh, but over the years, we only do Singapore history, but no Malayan history. I mean, Malaysian history, right? I mean, there's something. No, it's impossible to do Singapore history outside Malaysia. Right? So this is something which I thought, you know. And for Malaysia too, it's impossible to do Malaysia a unique history outside Nusantara, right? Likewise, Singapore outside the bigger Nusantara. So I think this is where you know we keep on talking about you know imagine community, but we don't have to imagine history. Yeah, historical imagination for that sense, I think. So this is where the Nusantara Bergerak Aid Institute, yeah, calling for the, the realization of our young researcher, that we need to see that our historical unit is not just nation state, but a bigger cultural uh, sphere. Yeah. I mean, in Europe, of course, people always say that Europe has this you know, nation state, and they keep on talking about you know, when nationalism uh, first was born in Europe because of you know of, of ethnic sentiment, blah blah blah. But generally, Europeans are conscious of they are Europeans. You know, the people in Denmark know that what's, you know, that is a bigger history of England and France involving in the bigger politics of Europe, and likewise and so on. But not in our case, because we have been too isolated, and our nationalism has given colour to our own nation state. Uh, Zin, you have mentioned the <coughs> as archival things, which is, which is good, yeah. But, um, I think, uh, we need to place Kala in the contestation of ideas during that period. Because remember, you cannot study Kala alone here, right? Because at that time, there are other, also other groups. For example, there's a British Harian group that also published Mastika, if I'm not mistaken, right? So they have another slang. And then we have all these small pockets of Malay socialists, like Gil, that are also publishing. You cannot deny that. So these are part part and parcel of the contestation of ideas. And this archival cannot be an isolated material. And most importantly, I think, Zain, that you need to place um, uh, this, um, what do you call it, the, the archival thing, uh, in the sense of um, not just a particular themes that they carry out, but look at the kind of Malay intelligentsia in Singapore during that period. And what happened after separation, what kind of intelligentsia that we have that cannot produce that kind of color? And I think also the same thing for Malaysia. For example, even after we separated, the one in Singapore, you know, the one group of intelligentsia of that time, mostly Malaysian. And then those that return back to Malaysia were also being cut off from a bigger things. When they were in Singapore, they were more Indonesian oriented. They read a lot of Indonesian work. But the moment they got separated, 
They transfer to Kuala Lumpur. They are also Maha Chakar, yeah? They have one, their Malay pleasure went into the stage called Parochialism. Intellectual Pantra. Maybe it may be offensive to Malaysian, but if you look carefully, when it was in Singapore, when we were together, we were more cosmopolitan, based on the archival things. So many things that they were. They support Indonesia, the world, Islamic reform, blah blah blah. But when we separated, we no longer have that cosmopolitan Nusantara outlook. What happened then? So something I think, this is actually historical question that we, yeah? Because many people lamented that when the Malay intelligentsia left for Kuala Lumpur, I mean they no longer in Singapore, uh, Singapore intellect, uh, Malay cultural landscape was barren. Yeah, well, if you can understand because most of them are Malay Cikgu, right? And Malay Cikgu are mostly primary school teachers, right? So the kind of discourse they, they took up are also very limited, right? Uh, so this is where something, all right, uh, we can discuss more and then I actually want to give to Hasnan, but when I look at it, later on I'll be accused that, oh no, Jamal is the only uh, female speaker here, you know, and then, you know, I should be put last. I better not do that. Alright? So now it's there. Alright, you have to. And she's from UTF.
Mereka tak tengok parti-parti survei anak atau dia orang tak tengok parti-parti kecil lain, uh, yang lain Contohnya parti rakyat Malaysia sendiri ya, parti rakyat Malaysia pun satu, juga, uh, satu parti yang berhaluan kini juga Tapi tak diberikan peluang juga So, um, kenapa uh, kenapa masyarakat kemudian Parti Sanat Nasional nampak kata rakyat Nampak kata rakyat sebab dia orang merasakan um, Uh, mungkin mereka merasakan kapitalisme kapitalis masih diperlukan di Malaysia okay. uh, Mungkin dia orang masih menerima ekonomi yang neoliberal hmm. Mungkin lain, satu lain uh, Seperti katakan uh, Satu benda yang saya fikir juga lah uh, Sebab macam Dr. J. Umar Dan yang bertanding di Sungai Siput dulu dia buat kerja, kerat kerja dia di Sungai Siput tu hampir 30 tahun Hampir 30, 30 tahun, menurut pembacaan saya Tapi kenapa dia, beliau tidak boleh menang? Kenapa? Macam benda tu sebenarnya kita rasa kelakar Kenapa masyarakat kita ni tak boleh nak faham ke? Masyarakat kita ni susah sangat kena faham Yang sebenarnya parti aluan diri pun boleh membuat sesuatu untuk masyarakat jadi saya, saya rasa sebagai uh, seperti yang saya maklumkan tadi Parti-parti dominan ni yang sebenarnya membadurkan masyarakat Dan mungkin saya, kata, uh, mungkin saya boleh kata Kurangnya golongan intelektual juga Kalau ada pun um, saya, uh, Mungkin kroni ke yang mengamalkan nepotism Yang selalu menyebut parti-parti dominan saja Dan uh, kalau kita kata uh, PSM ni uh, tak sokong wanita langsung tak boleh juga macam contoh macam macam ni yang saya kira kan sebenarnya saya ada slide tapi uh, slide tu tak dimainkan lagi pun saya okey je <laughs> saya dah tahu ok macam kita dapat lihat eh. ok uh, senarai dun eh yang kita ni PSM dalam PRU 14 kita dapat lihat kita dapat lihat ada tiga wanita dia wanita yang bertani Dan lagi satu persepsi yang uh, negatif juga terhadap PSM adalah Parti ini sepenuhnya parti orang India Sebab majoriti orang yang selalu Orang kata pun menolong masyarakat yang selalu menjadi kepimpinan Orang India Sedangkan tak pun Sedangkan presiden PSM sendiri orang lain sendiri So benda-benda kecil ini sebenarnya yang efek undi PSM kali ini Kalau kita tengok uh, uh, jumlah undi Contohnya uh, dari sebenarnya lah tu sebenarnya last uh, last period kita dapat lihat sepuluh ribu ke atas sebenarnya dia. Sekarang jumlah ini dia pada, pada period empat belas satu ribu dua ratus enam puluh tiga saja. Napa berlaku macam ni? Sebab tak gunakan logo PKR. Jadi udah tu undi tu undi tu pecah dan orang rasa kan bahawa sebelum ni 